Welcome to Positive Talk Radio. Our goal is simple, to explore evolving ideas one conversation at a time. So stay with us as right now we present. Do you like thrillers? Do you like high flying novels that have will keep you on the seat of your pants? And one person actually said, if you're up all night reading this, don't blame us. It's, it's because you picked up the book. We've got a uh, a great uh, author and pilot, and he's been and an uh, Edgar nominated for High Wire, which is the book that we're going to be talking about today. And all the things that he does, he's he is uh, he was born in Iran, educated around the world. Uh, we're going to talk about his. Uh, hopefully, we're going to talk about his upcoming book too which is um, called Silent Voices. And we're going to talk about, hopefully, what he's got in mind there as well. Cam Majd is with us. And uh, Cam, you've been on the show before, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and I'm glad you're here again today. Um, and we're going to be talking about your book, High Wired. How are you? Doing great. And, yes, it was wonderful last time. Thank you for having me back. Oh, anytime, anytime. I love, I love people that uh, are following their dreams and, and you've had a marvelous career and now it's budding into, it appears to be a second career, um, which I hope is going to be as successful as the first career was. Uh, it's, it's looking great. I've been very fortunate. Uh, the book has done very well. It's received very well, the reviews. And again, you know, that people get in touch with you and, and, and tell you how much they've enjoyed it. You know, and a couple that uh, get in touch with you and yell at you because you didn't get some fact exactly right. But mostly it's been uh, very much on the positive side. So I'm, I'm very lucky and, and fortunate and happy, you know, with the outcome. Boy, and I got to tell you, because on your on your web page, there is a review page and that thing is filled. I mean, not it's not like <laughs> you, you sat there one afternoon and started writing five star reviews. You had to run out of things to say. But it is filled with positive reviews, and and the book actually uh, is four four and a half, four and a three quarter stars, uh, because a lot of people love they love a thriller, they love the technical aspects of it, and it's it's really was a, is a fine piece of work that you put together, sir. Uh, again, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, again, very fortunate. Uh, the media has been very kind to me. New York Post, uh, Publishers Weekly. Herald Tribune and, and on and on, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm just, just, you know, can't say enough about it. And, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate to be here. Well, and you not only have done all of that, you've, you've done, uh, um, a lot of interviews with a lot of really cool people. And, uh, I think, I think it's great that, that you're doing so much, so much work, uh, and to get the word out there, you've, you've been on CBS. NBC News, Fox, um, all over the place. It's great. It's great that you you you're becoming a. Did you think that when you were behind the wheel or behind the steering wheel of a seven seventy seven, that you would be a famous author one day? <laughs> I don't know if famous is exactly the right word for it just yet, <laughs> but uh, you know, I no, I didn't, uh, and I didn't even. And that was never the intention. Uh, you know, and you had a story to write and, uh, you know, and, and I knew what the story was going to be. It was about automation and all the computers that are in an airplane in the world and how dependent we are on those. And computers, of course, are wonderful, uh, you know, to have, their, you know, make things so much better and safer. But we are very much dependent on them. So that was the story. And then I decided how do I want to tell the story. You know, I wanted to tell from, from a viewpoint of someone who's already uh, comes in from a point of, you know, uh, you know, weakness, I guess, you know, it's, it's going to be a female pilot. People are going to be questioning why is she here, you know, in a very much dominant, you know, males, uh, you know, man's world. And uh, so once I had the story and who wants to tell it, it was just kind of getting lost in the story. I didn't sit down and say, you know, with Edgar's call or, with, you know, what will happen or, you know, with the, you know, folks like yourself here talking. It just it didn't, it wasn't some of those things that was in front of center. Um, you know, but that, that's just a nice sideline. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the journey has been been pretty incredible. You know, the highs are very high and the lows are not so much fun, um, you know, but uh, overall, uh, you know, it, it's just been wonderful to have people, you know, see it, like it, appreciate it, 
you know, and, uh, and then you get letters that say those things and, you know, just nothing but gratitude for that. Well, and like, like we said, you were a pilot for 40 years. You flew for American for a long time, didn't you? 35 years. 35 years with American. I've always wanted to know, because I've never been able to get into a cockpit when the, when the plane is in flight, but when after you take off and you set your, um, your course in, into the computer and stuff, what do you guys do there for, like, if, it's, if you're flying from Seattle to Georgia and you're going to be there for six and a half, what do you guys do? Do you get out the Ouija board or do you get out the cards <laughs> and play little cards? Or what, what does a pilot do when it's on uh, automatic pilot and you're going across the country? Uh, well, triple seven, we actually we're gonna go across the world. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, you know, uh, a seven, you know, 14 hour flights are very common. I have done 17 and a half hours in the cockpit before, um, you know, coming from Delhi to Kennedy and a, uh, you know, in the winter months, uh, what do you do? So, uh, absolutely automation is key. Autopilot is key. Uh, you know, most pilots, you know, anywhere between five minutes after takeoff to 15, 20 minutes after takeoff, they'll turn their autopilot on. And then uh, turn it, you know, so, and then they'll turn it off again, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes before landing, uh, because you want that to do all the work. If you're at high altitudes, you know, in the, you know, 30,000 feet or so, it's very difficult, you know, from hand flying, keeping something within 200 feet, which is where you need to be uh, in order not to bust your altitude. Uh, and so the autopilot does an incredible job, takes care of all of that. And what do we do? Um, you know, we, we, we manage. Uh, you know, we manage systems, we manage, uh, you know, the courses. We're, of course, there, you know, for uh, a lot of things that can go wrong. We manage, you know, the cabin, you know, uh, the needs and, you know, anything. You know, there's a common thing to hear, you know, in aviation that, uh, you know, aviation is, is you know, 99%, uh, you know, boredom followed by 1% of sheer terror. You know, you just <laughs> you just don't know which one percent that is. You know, so you know, just have to be ready for it at all times. Um, and then, of course, as you start to, you know, uh, you, you need to communicate with ground. You need to communicate with if you're over the ocean, you know, through the computers. You need to make sure you're going in the right direction. You know, there's so much to do. That's pretty helpful. Uh, yeah, because you know, as you start to go, you know, it doesn't take much to to you know, get off course, you know, get lost for something to go wrong, you know, triple uh, seven, you know, with, you know, millions of moving parts and, and so many variations, you know, weather goes bad someplace, you know, and you can no longer go there. You have fuel limitations, you know, um, just so you're, you're managing, you're watching to make sure everything is doing what it's supposed to do and you're communicating, you know, with the air traffic control, make sure that you're, you know, uh, you know, you have the separation that you're supposed to maintain with other, you know, et cetera. Those are good. You're communicating with a company. Uh, you're, you know, uh, looking forward to see what happens in the next hour or five hours from now or 15 hours from now. You know, whether your destination, the weather is still good or if it is not good, what what is your plan B and plan C? Um, just, just managing systems, managing everything. Not to mention that... Uh, you know, on board. I mean, you you know, I think you have 300 and some odd passengers in a 777-300 series in American Airlines. Um, I mean, anything can happen. You know, if you if you have an, you know, a, an engine blow up, that's your responsibility. And if you run out of toilet paper, that's your responsibility. Uh, you know, so it's a wide range of uh, things to cover. And, uh, and, and you just don't know, you know, what you need to be doing and, and where. Again, everything changes. I mean, you go to London, there is no flights from, from L.A. to any place, you know, overseas that is always the same. You know, you just have to be prepared for what you have to do different this time. It would be really interesting because when you, anytime you get 350 human beings together, there's bound to be conflict about something somewhere about too much to drink or not enough to drink or, or, running out of toilet paper i didn't think a captain would be in charge of toilet paper but maybe i'm wrong well you know no think about it uh you know what, what happens if you have 300 people on board an aircraft and um you're going you know on a 15-hour flight and you're on a toilet paper 
You have 300 people. Now think about it. You know, it, it, it sounds silly. It sounds like, you know, a benign. That, that could create a full-fledged emergency. Um, sure. You know, what, what, what are you going to do with 300 people that need to go to the bathroom two or three or four times each? That would absolutely be an emergency. Uh, in fact, we have had that case. I had a case uh, when we took off from Boston for L.A. It was just a coast-to-coast flight, and they did not service the labs. And we forgot to check them. I don't know whatever the process was. This was on a 767. And so we took off and, you know, an hour into it, they told us that the labs, you know, are not, are not flushing. Only one out of five or so of that, lab, uh, you know, labs are working. Um, I've got, you know, in that airplane, maybe 250 people. <laughs> you know, that's a full-fledged emergency. And so we ended up having to divert, go down to Chicago, dump the labs, and then take off again. Uh, so it, it's not a, it's an unforgiving when you're in a three dimensional environment, you know, you can't just pull over on the side here and, and you know, click your blinkers and wait for something to happen. You know, uh, you, you, it's up to you to figure out everything. And, uh, uh absolutely. They're all, you know, you, and, and like I said, you just never know what will occur. Maybe nothing, hopefully nothing, you know, uh, but that's not, there's no guarantees. I, I, I can now see how losing two or three of your potties would be a really bad thing when you've got a bunch of folks that that need to go, and and what do you do? And it's not like you got a bunch of Sears catalogs hanging around that that you can that people can use either. So um, that's that's interesting. So and you also monitor all the gauges and make sure that the the uh, temperatures are right and and all that kind of stuff. I and there's a lot to know. There's a lot to do, isn't there? All the systems in a cockpit, I mean, everybody has seen a picture of a cockpit or from time to time walked into one. You know, everything you're looking at is very much real. Every one of those things is a system that is critical to, you know, the safety, you know, of that flight. It could be, you know, the engines, you know, those are the big, you know, big obvious things that seem to you, but some of the things are not. You could have an air problem, you know, uh, you know, and a good pressurization or air conditioning. You could get too hot, too cold. You know, it could be, you know, electronics, hydraulics, could be anything, you know, and, and any one thing, again, there's different degrees of degradation. You know, you could have, uh, you know, uh, you got six backups or something, you know, and the first, you know, first portion of it fails, numbers two, pick it up, you know, three, pick it up. But what if you only have two backups, you know, and then one of them fails? Now you're down to nothing. You, know, you have two engines. You used to have three engines. You used to have three pilots. And sometimes you have four engines. Now we have two two engines and two pilots on pretty much every aircraft that's being built today, other than you know maybe the 380, which they're they're discontinuing, or 747 that has not been discontinued. Um, you know, mostly you have two pilots, two aircraft. So when you have two of anything and one of those two fails, you're in, in an immediate critical mode. You know, you got to do something. You got to get something on the ground. You know, and then you got to get yourself out of that environment pretty quickly. Uh, you have two engines. Okay, great. Uh, you know, everything works out great 99.8% of the time or something like that. But that two tenths of a percent when it doesn't, you know, and you're going, you know, you're three hours over the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, you know, someplace where you can or, or Siberia, you know, um, what are you going to do? You know, you got to have a plan. You got to figure out what you got to do. There are limitations to abide by. There are uh, restrictions that you have to follow, and uh, and, and the you know, clock starts ticking pretty fast. And there's a lot of those. There's a lot of computers that have a single backup. There's a lot of systems that have a single backup, and you know, time has proven that the single backup is good enough. You know, because of a lack of failures, because they're so dependent. But again, you know, the when they just say so dependent, that means, you know, they're not bulletproof. Well, exactly. And I, you know, I, I've thought about this. Whenever you hear of a plane going down, and I know that it's, it's difficult for the passengers and it's hell on them, but to be in the cockpit when your plane is in trouble, have you ever thought about what that's, I, I'm hoping that has never happened to you personally. But have you ever thought about what that's happening and what those guys are going through as they're losing control of the aircraft? We think about that all the time. I can't imagine there's anyone that has spent any number of years in a cockpit that has not thought about that. 
um, uh, you know, and it has certainly happened to me, you know, and again, 44 years in cockpits, 35 of them in American Airlines. Um, you know, sooner or later, something will happen. For me, there were five individual events where I really wished I was on the ground. Uh, you know, but five and 44 years is not so bad. You know, as far as uh, uh, the passengers, it, it is uh, front and center in every captain's mind. You know, um, what are they feeling? How are they reacting? You know, uh, uh, you know that you have to be, you know, uh, straightforward with them. You have to be honest with them. You're not trying to panic them. Uh, you know, because none of that does any good. Um, you know, and and uh, so yeah, absolutely, that's front and center. Uh, you know, in, in our thoughts, in our minds, in how to manage them, you know, because last thing you need to do is just have a bunch of folks panicking back there and doing, you know, the wrong things. So listening to the flight attendants who are there primarily for, you know, the, the passenger safety, you know, is one of those key points that you emphasize on, you know, as well as, you know, keeping them informed, you know, um, through PAs, through, you know, uh, you know, whatever means that are available to you, letting the flight attendants know so that they can communicate with them, you know, and so on. Keeping them calm, uh, but, you know, ready for, you know, whatever action needs to be taken. This is it's really key. Well, you know, it's, it takes some kind of courage, I would think, um, to because that that happens enough. It, it doesn't happen. It happens. Fortunately, it happens less now than it used to. Um, but it still is. Um, it takes a, a great deal of courage to be able to know that whatever you're going to do and the outcome isn't going to be great. Um, that, that must be really hard in, to, to, to process as you're going through that. And you, you had five experiences that you would rather have back. And in, in, even in 44 years, that's still a lot when you think about it, because that's, that's in, your, in your mind and that doesn't go away. No, it does not. And, and thankfully, that's one of the things that keeps you safe, uh, you know, every time you go fly, uh, your experience, your time in there. Um, and that's, I, you know, I don't have a point of reference, but I believe that's that's pretty common, you know, about one every 10 years is, is pretty common among, uh, you know, pilots, you know, airline uh, folks. Anyhow. Um, yeah, listen, there's you are still in a, you know, in a piece of aluminum tube that's going the speed of sound. Um, you know, over, you know, uh, unforgiving territory. Um, you know, as you start to, you know, uh, punch over the East Coast or the West Coast, starting into, you know, heading out over the Black Ocean, you know, knowing that there's nothing in front of you and whatever was behind you is getting further and further away. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that's going to, you know, make you more alert. You are going to pay closer attention to, you know, um, your instruments and, uh, you know, is there an engine vibration going on? Is there, a, you know, oil quantities, hydraulic quantities? Is something too hot, something too cold? You know, what's the weather like when I get there? <clears throat> you know, a great example of that is the Hawaiian Islands. You know, um, you know there, there's, you know, five airports over there. Well, the Hui, Maui, um, Honolulu, uh, Kona, and um, Hilo. And there's a couple of other, you know, places. So essentially five airports that are out there, but they're very, you know, clustered. They're next to each other. So you're looking for tips of some volcanoes. You're looking for the tips of five volcanoes over there, you know, and it's 3,000 miles away from that. And you got another 2,000 miles on the other side before you see another tips of another, you know, some more volcanoes. Um, so you go through there. If there's a hurricane going through there, yeah. you know, if there is, uh, you know, uh, if your navigation fails and you end up two degrees, one degree off course, you know, one degree off course here is all it would take to end up 500 miles away, you know, when you get over there, 300 miles away by the time you get over there. Um, you, know, you just really have to be, uh, you know, and, and if something does go wrong, the furthest two points on the planet Earth with no land is between Los Angeles and Honolulu. And Hawaii, essentially, you know, Hilo closest airport. Right. Um, furthest two points. There's no place that you can go to that that's further than these two with nothing, no place to land in between. Um, you know, what if you have a fire, you know, somebody smokes a cigarette in a bathroom, you know, and then puts it out in the, you know, somewhere, you know, and then the mechanics don't work or something happens in the cargo compartment that you don't have any access to. So there's such a variety of things that, that just keep you occupied, keep you on your toes. And um, 
like I said, you fly, you know, enough times, you know, something, man. not to mention, you know, people, you know, somebody gets a heart attack, you know, uh, you know, somebody gets, gets sick or, you know, somebody's fighting with somebody. Unfortunately, one of those things that you're seeing more and more of nowadays, uh, you know, with the, you know, the environment that's out there. So there's a lot of times, a lot of places where uh, things can go wrong. And you just, you just have to be, you know, ready for those eventualities because, Again, it doesn't happen on almost every flight, but you just never know when it will. And that keeps you on your, that has to keep you on your toes. The entire time. Uh, so the entire, that, you don't so go I, to the bathroom as a captain, you don't go to the bathroom thinking that, you know, I'm gonna be gone four minutes. You know, what happens in those four minutes? If you know, knowing certainly, you know, all well that nothing will happen because nothing ever does. But what if it does? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it makes you it makes you go potty that much quicker. Oh yeah, <laughs> those are some fast fast potty breaks. Exactly. Now, uh, I assume now when you're flying 17 hours, you do have you have more than two pilots. I would imagine. Yeah, general rule, and there are some exceptions, but the general rule for the airline flow, folks, you know, Part 121, they call it is uh, any flight up to eight hours, you only need one set of crew, you know, two people, a captain or a first officer, anything between eight and 12 hours, you need one and a half crews, you meaning that you bring out an extra captain or an extra first officer, and anything over 12 hours, you need two sets of crews, uh, two captains, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it could be one captain and three first officers. Um, and I think there's a limitation there past potential 16 hours that you need two captains and two FOs. Um, so they have a system, you know, there are some exceptions to that, but that's generally the rule and, and you take breaks. So on a long flight, I mean, you're going from, you know, um, LA to Shanghai or, you know, uh, one of those places, Sydney, you know, Auckland, uh, you're going to take, you know, uh, first 15, 20 minutes of the flight, everybody's on board watching everything. And once all, all things are settled and you start to get to your climb altitude, then, Whoever is resting leaves, goes back to the crew bunk area. And it's a bunk. It's a small room. So it's a, you know, kind of a pantry, you know, a large pantry, uh, two business class seats, two beds. And, uh, you know, you take your rest and then you just divide them up. You know, uh, the first half hour, last half hour, everybody's on board. Everything in between, you're just taking three hours on, three hours off, or two hours on, two hours off, et cetera. So that's why I never see a captain or a first officer sitting amongst the passengers when they're taking a break is because you've, you've got a little crew quarters that they can go to. Depending on the airplane, you know, a seven, uh, triple seven, 300 series has a bunk bed, you know, upstairs, you actually have stairs, two floors, you go up there, uh, triple seven, 200 series. The, the bunk bed is just after the cockpit. So, um, you know, you're going to be able to go in there. You'll see them coming in and out. Uh, Airbus is similar. Some of the airplanes have, you know, bigger rooms, some of them less room. And, and no, generally, you will not see a captain at a first office. A guy with a four strap and three strap up. Unless, of course, in a rare occasion, let's say they have, you know, a, it's a 17 hour flight and you have, you know, the two captains and two FOs. Then two are always taking a break. Captain and four are taking a break while the other captain and four are in the, in the controls. And then they switch. So, but that's 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 pretty rare. Well, that's that's cool because I would, I you know, seventeen hours is a long time to be in the in the cockpit paying attention to everything. So, you know, this this has been very interesting for me because you know you provide and you can provide us with a a look into what it is that you guys do that generally the general public has no earthly idea what it is you do or how complicated it is. And I'm assuming because you're monitoring all of these gauges and, and pressures and, and all of that, that you, there's a great deal of schooling that has to go with that to understand what each of those things does so that you can monitor them properly. I, I would assume, is that correct? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so aircraft, uh, you know, once you get to a certain level, you know, say the airline level, um, you know, uh, uh, those, those types of aircraft, uh, they're all similar. And they're not the same, but they are similar in so far as they have the same systems. Every aircraft has a hydraulic system, airline type aircraft. Every aircraft has, you know, an electric system, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, air system, you know, fuel system, you know, engines, et cetera, et cetera, navigation system and so on. Uh, but you go say from, you know, if you're, if you're going from Boeing to Boeing, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have some similarity. If you go from Airbus to Airbus, they're even more similar. But if you go from a Boeing to an Airbus or vice versa, uh, then they're quite a bit different. Even though they each have a hydraulic system, but hydraulic systems are completely different. You know, in a Boeing, you know, there's three systems. There's left, you know, center and right, you know, and then in, in an Airbus, it's going to be, you know, green, yellow and blue. Uh, for some reason, they didn't want to, the two <laughs> manufacturers didn't want to sound the same, look the same, whatever, you know, and then that's what they did. Um, you know, but the, regardless of what you do, uh, and most airlines, certainly this was an American, whenever you switch airplanes, whether you switch seats from left seat to the right seat, or you switch an airplane from, you know, 757 to a 767, or 777 to 787, then you got to go through a month of school. 30, 35 days of school. Two weeks of it is sitting on the ground looking at systems and two weeks of it is in the simulator figuring out, you know, what, you know, the what if scenarios. And so two weeks of it is normal situations. Two weeks of it is, you know, uh, uh, non-normal situations. And then by that time you come through after 30 days, you kind of, you're more familiar with this. There's more training online when you're done. Uh, you have to fly a certain number of hours with the check airman so that they can make sure that, that you're okay, you know, um, actually being in the environment. And then after that, they'll let you on your own. That's a, that's, that's a lot of detail that you have to learn and go through and stuff. But now, <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, Cam, but this podcast is being produced outside of Seattle, which used to be, now they're in Chicago, used to be the home of the Boeing company. We still have got a huge presence here. And so you can you can defer this question if you want to, but which would you rather fly, a Boeing jet or an Airbus jet? Um, a Boeing jet. Oh, uh, thank you. Almost everyone that says this and, and, and flies this prefers Boeing. Even even Airbus guys prefer Boeing. Um, it's it's more uh, it's more designed around a pilot. I think for one thing, you have a yoke. You know, you you, you got a yoke that you turn around. Airbus, you have sticks, you know, it's a, you know, six, seven inch stick that's sitting on one side, you know, and the two sticks and here, the two, you have two yokes, captain and FO's yokes. One turns, the other one turns, one pulls, the other one pulls. In an Airbus, you got the stick on the left side for the captain and one on the right side for the FO, uh, but one moves, the other one stays steady, doesn't, you know, oh. so there are certain things like that. Now, having said that, uh, Airbus planes are also fantastic. Uh, you know, so I, I may be, you know, uh, I've, I've flown a lot more Boeings than I have Airbuses, so maybe that's, you know, I'm, I'm a big little prejudice about that, but um, Airbus has a lot of great advantages too. I mean, not having a yoke isn't all that bad, because you can cross your legs, you know, and you have a tray, there's a tray that comes up, and, and you, you don't, you're not eating your meal and, and, and the pants of your legs, you know, you're eating it actually on a tray, Uh so they're both fantastic. They, they really are. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and I wouldn't give it up and you know, change it for anything. But, but if I had to, if I had to pick, I would say 52, 48 Boeing. Well, and there's, there's, isn't that one of the reasons why Southwest flies only 737s, I believe. And is because it's easy for training. It's easy one that if the entire fleet is one type of aircraft, uh, absolutely. Just imagine, you know, imagine if the entire fleet is one aircraft. Um, I don't have to train, you know, uh, a captain to fly a different kind of an airplane. I don't have to fly, you know, train a first officer to fly a different kind of airplane. Uh, you know, the, the, the training for pilots becomes multiples of times easier. The training for the maintenance people becomes multiples of times easier. Uh, the, the spare parts you have to keep. You know, everything becomes easier, significantly easier. Uh, those are the, the good parts. The bad side of it is, you know, you're going you're gonna to go in and you're going to get a job at Southwest or you're going to fly Southwest. You'll fly 737s on your first day and you will fly 737s on your last day. Uh, you know, and there is something to be said. I mean, I flew, I don't know, six or eight different type of airplanes at American Airlines. You know, I flew short hauls, long hauls, uh, 
you know, international stuff. I mean, Southwest, the biggest international thing they do is now Hawaii. And they only started doing that, I don't know, five or 10 years ago. Uh, before that, it was it was just, just you know, very much a regional carrier. Uh, again, great things, you know, wonderful airline. People that work for it, love it. And, you know, it's just, um, you know, uh, for me, being able to switch up was a big, big deal. You know, I really enjoyed being able to, you know, fly long hauls, you know, and, uh, you know, go, go places that you know, just wouldn't get a chance to do here, you know, in a small airline. But is it easier to maintain? Absolutely. You know, just just your training uh, cycles alone. I mean, you know, just on, on so many levels. You, you're, you know, the, the ramp folks, you know, that are loading, you know, and unloading the bags. You know, they only have to know one kind of aircraft, not, you know, this kind and that kind. And all the support equipment that you need. You know, American Airlines needs, you know, different types of tugs to push you back, depending on the weight of the aircraft or you know, uh, loaders and unloaders, you know, for taking the luggage in and out of, you know, it takes a different type of a loader and a tug to take care of a 737 than it does a 777, which weighs four times as much, three and a half times as much. Uh, so it el eliminates all of that. But then again, from, you know, with that comes, you know, something else, you know, that's just the routineness of just being in the same thing, you know, for the rest of your life. So. Well, you know, it's, it's, you've, you've taught me a lot here because in the previous conversation that we had, I learned that um, it is a seniority based system. And if I were a captain that had gained some me measure of seniority, I would really like to be able to, you know, pick a trip to maybe Taiwan or, or uh, to Japan or to Australia so that I can see that part of the country and that part of the world where if it's a, a ca regional carrier like Southwest, it's like, okay, am I going to go to Albuquerque or am I going to go to uh, um, Oklahoma, you know, or, or Oklahoma city. So it's, it's, you know, I can, I can see how once you've been in the system a while and you're comfortable flying that the um, it would be much more interesting to have diversity of flight rather than, it all being the same for some people and you know listen some some of the people just like the routineness of it some people like to just be in a smaller place it's a faster uh you know work it's it's tough to go from here to taiwan and just you know take breaks you know here if you go up and down three or four times in a day that keeps you busy so you know some people just like that some people like this and god bless them that, that that's how it works out uh, for me uh, the variety made a big difference and i was you know i held out it was Hired by you know other airlines, but I held out for American, and uh, you know thrilled that happened. And wouldn't change that uh, for anything. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to explain all of this air airplane stuff to us, because I know that in your book, which by the way, that's what we're talking about. We're talking to Cam Maj and his book, which by the way, the the book is called High Wire, and. Uh, it's about a woman who stands accused, but the cost of uh, to prove her innocence may just be her life. I I love I love that, and, and uh, it's a it's a high wire act, as it were. And how long in the development process was this book? How long did you think about before you started writing it? Uh, not long. This was you know I've, I've written books that you know, this was this was only about six months from beginning to end. But I've had another book where, you know, it's taken 20 years, uh, you know, to try and put the end on it, you know. Uh, uh, so this was, uh, the story was mostly just formed in my head. You know, I wanted to, to write a story about the captain who's wrongfully accused. Uh, the, the captain who, um, uh, you know, essentially purposely crashes an airplane when the airplane is very close to the ground, knowing that it's the unthinkable. But she did it because the aircraft controls, flight controls stop responding to our commands. And she knew if they take off and continue going, that it would end up crashing at a higher altitude and everyone would be lost. In this case, you know, there's six people lost. And of course, all fingers are pointed to her because there is no clear indication of what happened, you know? And, and so the fact that it's a woman, you know, uh, the, the questions are raised about her, you know, ability and, and you know, the quality of her training, whether she should have been in the seat at all. And uh, so she not only has to do what a pilot has to do, she has to overcome the fact that she's a female, 
you know, and that the way she's perceived, you know, in the industry, through the media, you know, and it takes the, the length of the book to learn. So the, the, the whole crash occurs in chapter one. That's the first chapter. So she spends the length of the book to try and prove herself and prove what is what has happened. And, and it's a computer virus that has been placed into the systems, uh, you know, of the, the aircraft, the flight control systems. Until uh, towards you know, until she comes face to face with the with the person who's created it, and there she learns that another aircraft has been contaminated halfway over the Atlantic, with no chance of coming back, and uh, the only rare uh, smallest possibility of saving them is if she uh, essentially tries to sacrifice herself, gets on a plane and goes out there and tries to save them, but won't be able to come back, and. Um, that's kind of you know um, how the book is, and that's that's how it ended. I won't give too much of that away. Let you. See yeah, don't that. don't give any more away because now now somebody I want to read the book. It's, it sounds it's now I got to ask you when they take this book, and I know it's being shopped in Hollywood right now. When they take this book and they put a screenplay to it, and then they uh, the casting director shows up, who do you want to play the heroine? You know, they, they have asked me that this question several times, um, many times. It's a young female person who is a first generation immigrant. Uh, Brie Larson would be amazing. Jennifer Lawrence would be great at it. Uh, you know, she's in her mid 30s. She has a five year old, uh, you know, daughter. She's an orphan. I'm sorry, she's a, she's a widow. And, um, so I, I think both of those ladies have shown a great range of, you know, ability, uh, you know, to portray different, you know, emotions. But I'm sure there are many other great actors out there that would be, you know, fantastic in the role. But those two, the two that just came to mind when I was asked. I I, I vote for uh, uh, Jennifer Lawrence. I think I think sure her acting skills are amazing and and her comedic skills uh after watching her last movie were, were really good too so um i i agree with you that that would that would be awesome i hope it gets picked up and if you are a hollywood uh, uh producer get the get the book and 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 read it and 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 call cam and uh, maybe you guys can strike a deal uh to to take the book and make a movie out of it because it's one of those movies that or one of those books that i think really lends well to to making a movie out of it yeah I, that, that's what i've been told uh, there's been a lot of interest in it out there um there's a i have an agent out there ryan lipson he is uh you know just started shopping it around but again you know the writer's strike happened i think it was april is when it started uh, it's already taken so long uh, so that's kind of not helping too much but you know it is what it is till till it's not Boy, I gotta tell you, look at you. You're a pilot for 40 years. You you you're an author, an award-winning author. You've got an agent. My goodness gracious, look at you. Thank you. I've been very fortunate and uh very, very happy to be here. Just see I, how things go. I think that there's there's perhaps being fortunate is a degree of it, but there's also a lot of talent there that you're just using your your god-given talents to create something great and i think i think that's that's wonderful i would i wish that we all even after we retire and you're supposed to now you know go play golf or whatever that we all uh, live our passion and we go pursue stuff that makes us happy um and you can you can help people at the same time so i think that's awesome thank you thank you very much i'm uh, I'm, I'm thrilled again you know, to be able to use your time, you know, doing what you want to do versus, you know, what you have to do. Even though it wasn't like that in aviation, every pilot loves what they're doing and they enjoyed that. But, um, you know, now, you know, as you start to, you know, the retirement phase of life, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to go to London and not spend, you know, spend more than 22 hours there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, because that's yeah. what it was for, I don't know, 15 years. You know, or go to Hawaii and not come back the next morning or the next all night. I can actually spend, you know, a week there and, and enjoy it. Uh, but having said that, it's also so lovely to be able to, you know, use your time uh, doing something that you love. I mean, to go, in, to go from something that you love to something else that you love. I mean, how lucky am I? 
I, I, I can tell you, I see, I was involved in mass transit for 12 years as well. Only mine was driving a bus in Seattle and, uh, it's different than, than we don't get off the ground. Number one. And so well, I also drove a bus. It was an Airbus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> exactly. But well, yours was a bit more complicated than, than what I did, but there, there are still components and I loved what I did. I love talking to the people See, and that's the thing you, as a, as a pilot, your interactions with the, um, air traveling public are rather limited. Um, you don't get to go back and, and hobnob with them. You probably wouldn't want to, quite frankly, after a couple of cocktails are served or something. I think <laughs> so. So, so, but, but it's, it's great to have you here. And, and the name of the book again is high wire and, uh, and go, go get the, the, the book. You can get it. It's available everywhere or you, and you can also go to his website. I love your website. They've got you've got a, a radio or a, a podcast that you did not too long ago. That's right there on the front page. You can so you can go to that and you can learn all about Positive Talk Radio from that as well. And uh, but go go to his website, which is cammodged.com. That's k a k a m m a j d. Um, that's correct, right? Yes, it is. Just the dot com at the end of that. Or just can my books, you know, and all the social media and leave me a message, say hello. Uh, the book is available in every format, you know, hardback, paperback, audiobook, uh, you know, uh, Kindle, you know, and so on. Uh, and, and it's a fun read. It's, it's, you know, it's enjoyable. The next one, Silent Voices, is in the oven. Uh, it's all been done. It's fine. You know, it's being edited. And uh, we will see, you know, uh, what that does here in the next I'm guessing before before the end of the year for sure. Will you come back and talk about that book when it's time? I would love to. I would love I would love to have you. I know the premise of the book is it involves I'm not going to say anything, but it involves um, Afghanistan and the and that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so um, I, I hope that that comes out and it does as well as High Wire because this this book I got a feeling I got a feeling that you're going to be um, you're going to be walking the red carpet one of these days. Well, from your mouth to Hollywood's ears, <laughs> you know. But uh, it's it, it's fun. Re listen, seriously, regardless of what happens, it it really truly is a journey, and and it's been nothing but a blast. I, I have. Regardless of what happens, I've, I've had a lot of fun doing this. Well, I'm I'm glad because you you know to do something like this, it it is a legacy. Then you're putting together a legacy that you're leaving for the future, and that's and that's pretty awesome. All we have to do now is uh, get rid of the uh, writer strike and the actor strike, so everybody can go back to work their the way they're supposed to. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> you know, just, just making a whole bunch. I don't know what's taking so long, but guys, figure it out. Well, it's that AI thing, and uh, um, so they they're concerned about um, people about the producers using AI and actors aren't being used anymore, and voice actors and all that kind of stuff. So they'll figure it out, but it may take a while. Right. You know. So, is there anything else you'd like to add, or have I left anything out? Uh, no, you need it's, to... it's been a lot of fun. I, I look forward to seeing you again, and when Silent Voices comes out. And just a 10 second version, it's a story of two sisters, uh, you know, two blood sisters. One is born and raised in America. One is born and raised in Afghanistan. And she has no clue that she has an American heritage. She just doesn't understand why she has blonde hair and, and, and uh, blue eyes and light skin, you know, and then she's carrying, you know, uh, she's, 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 in, she's an Afghan. And uh, they, they find out about each other. The whole story takes place 30 days before the American pull out July of 2021. And so, and it's a fast paced thriller. We deal with warlords and uh, the poppy fields and special forces and, you know, and, and some of the insanity of what happened, you know, prior to that. I got to believe that a blue eyed blonde haired girl that is in Afghanistan who thinks she's an Afghanistan or Afghanistani. Is that right? Afghan. Afghan. And, and, and Afghan. And then, 
and everybody's saying, I don't know, but I don't think so. Or her poor mom is probably going, I didn't do it, really. I he would, you know, anyway. So that was that's a story for another time. But but Cam, thank you so much for be, for being here. I really appreciated having you on the show. And we will have you back with the new book when it comes out. And uh I hope this one but I I hope at this point in time we'll be talking about the writing of the screenplay for Highwire when we're talking about the new book. I, I, I'll look forward to that. And I'll look forward to seeing you again, Kevin. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you so much for being here. And if you wait right there, I'll be right back. Hey, thanks for enjoying this episode all the way to the end. Please give us a like and subscribe to this channel. This has been a production of PositiveTalkRadio.net. Please visit our website, oddly named PositiveTalkRadio.net, for more details about us and our mission, which is to provide great positive programming designed to inspire us all. I'm Kevin McDonald, and I'm proud of these shows, and I truly hope that you'll like them and share them with friends and family. So on behalf of our entire team, remember... Be kind to one another because each other's all we got.